Mother Knows Death, starring Nicole and Jemmy and Maria QK. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Mother Knows Death. We have a few announcements this week. First is that we have some new merch. We have two new shirts that Maria and I are wearing right now. So if you're watching on YouTube, you can see our two new designs. So the first one I'm wearing is this new Dora Mater crew neck. It's a little drawing of your hand holding a scalpel blade. It has some little details of your tattoos, your nails. It's really cute. And then tell everybody what you're wearing. And of course, Dora Mater translates to tough mother in Latin. And my shirt says Mortuai Vivo Stocent. Let me stand up a little bit for you. <laughs> and... <laughs> You can't see it that great, but that translates in Latin to the dead teach the living, which is my phrase. And it's it's really cool. And it's it's just a very neutral design, but a conversation starter for sure. And it just shows your love for pathology. Yeah. So next Thursday, March 21st at 3 p.m. Eastern, 12 p.m. Pacific time, our new merch is going to drop. It's going to be a very limited run. We're only going to do it one time. So you want to definitely make sure to check it out. You can go to doramater.shop to check out the countdowns only on there right now, but next Thursday the page will go live and you'll be able to purchase these. Awesome. I hope you guys get it and we could all be twinsies. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> okay. Next announcement is that we are going to be at CrimeCon. So Mother Knows Death is going to be there and I'll also be doing a lecture. Yeah, so May 31st to June 2nd in Nashville, Tennessee, we're going to be doing a live podcast for the first time ever. Please put up with me as I'm really <laughs> nervous by the idea. And then you're going to be doing a lecture as well. Yeah, I'm look. I'm really looking forward to it. I haven't really nailed down the title of my lecture yet, but I do have the idea ready. I'm not going to tell you guys quite yet, but I think you're really going to love it. But just FYI, it's going to be very, very graphic. Yeah, so we'll have more information rolling out about that over the next couple of weeks, so stay tuned, but we are very excited. Everybody knows Tennessee is my favorite place, so I'm definitely really excited to go, and it'll be nice to meet a bunch of people and hopefully get some new fans of the show, too. Yeah, definitely. All right, let's get started with the story of the week. So we need to talk about Boeing. We Yes, yeah, something is up for sure. When we were building the stories for this week, you know, we realized that we had at least four or five stories that were Boeing related this week. And so we were like, OK, we're just going to group these all into story of the week because there is just so much going on. So in the last couple of months, we've had a bunch of stories related to planes in general, but they all seemingly have ties to Boeing. So you know, first we had some ridiculous ones like excessive farting was turning around a plane or a man was coughing up blood and died on a plane or maggots were falling up, uh, fa falling from a suitcase in the overhead compartment. Um, and then we even covered one about an Alaskan Airlines pilot who was on mushrooms and tried to cut the engines to the plane, which with all this other with all these other stories, I didn't even remember we covered that. I was looking through our old episodes and was like, holy shit, there's been basically a plane story every a lot single of, week. A lot of airplane trauma, but this has to specifically do with the airplane it's, itself, it's particularly Boeing. It always seems like it's a Boeing. Yeah, so the next couple of stories are all Boeing related, whereas the last couple ones were just kind of mishaps that happened on a variety of planes. So we need to really take a serious look at what's happening because these are just reported incidents in the last week. So first, a United flight lost its tire. So last week, a United, a United Airlines Boeing 777 took off from San Francisco heading to Japan. When it took off, it immediately lost one of its tires, which then fell onto a parked car in one of the airport's, gar or in one of the airport's parking lots. So 249 passengers were aboard, and they had to reroute and land in LAX because of the tire. And the airline is saying it's designed to land safely if it's missing or has damaged tires. But, you know, I can't help but think, what if this landed on a car that was driving on the highway or on a house or on a person? Yeah, I know. It's so scary, right? And it's, you know how we say new fear unlocked every week? Like, oh, now, so now we have to worry about plain airplane tires falling from the sky and, and possibly killing us instantly like how scary is that no like the whole thing was so disturbing to me and i'm like i don't think i mean there's obviously safety concerns about how the aircraft can land safely when it's missing a tire but i think 
a lot of the concern was it crushing a car beneath it. I just, I just don't even understand how it was fine enough to take off and then moments later it fell off. Like something was maybe they just had recently changed it and didn't put it on tight enough or something. I don't know. Like, of course, we'll hear about the investigation in like six months or whatever. And this will be the last of our worries. But, but all the stuff that's going to happen between now and then with these planes. Yeah. So the next one is that 50 people were injured by a, quote, nosedive on a Boeing plane. <laughs> So that's so scary. A Boeing 787 9 Dreamliner was going from Australia to New Zealand. The flight, which was through Latham Airlines, that's a Chilean based company, was mid flight when it suddenly took a nosedive or otherwise known as a dramatic drop in altitude due to a technical error. So it threw those without seatbelts from their seats, tossed around passengers. They were hitting the roof of the plane if they weren't buckled in, they were being thrown in the aisles. One passenger stated, quote, some of the roof panels were broken from people being thrown up and knocking into them. Oh and there was God. blood coming from several people's heads. They said it was basically less than a minute, but it felt like an intense earthquake in that time. OK, th this is my word of advice just because of this. And of course, the, the biggest one we've covered is when the airplane, when the door flew off the airplane mid-flight, is that you really should always wear your seatbelt in the airplane, I except if you have to get up and go to the bathroom or something. I just would never, ever, after hearing these stories, because just with the airplane door and this one now, that you would be safe if you were in a seatbelt and you, you would have been secure, at least in these types of accidents. Yeah, definitely. So all of this is, you know, sparking some concerns. Like, what was the technical error that happened? You know, one person's in critical condition from this. Um, I don't know. And then the passengers complained that after, so they did end up landing on time to their destination. And then the passengers are complaining that all they did was give them a McDonald's hamburger while they waited and they weren't fed again till the next morning. It, it's, it's unbelievable, right? Like after experiencing something like that, you would, I don't know, I feel like you expect them to give you some money or free flights for life or something. And they're just like, oh, well, here's a hamburger for your trouble. Yeah, exactly. And then the airline has come out with a statement that says, quote, it, regr it regrets the inconvenience and injury the situation may have caused its passengers and reiterates its commitment to safety as a priority. Well, your recommitment to safety should be to reevaluate re your relationship with Boeing. Yeah, exactly. So I think everyone needs to do that at this point. Yeah. So then we lead into a story that is fresh from last night which we just added right before recording. We already <laughs> had all of this, which is nuts. So an American Airlines flight was forced to make an emergency landing in California Wednesday night after the pilot reported a possible mechanical issue. It took off from Dallas-Fort Worth, Texas. The pilot reported the issue with the Boeing 777 plane and ultimately, ultimately landed at LAX at approximately 8.45 p.m. last night. So... There's reports that it was a blown tire, but American Airlines has not confirmed that. So that's kind of scary that they're not coming forth and saying what it was, right? Uh, that's, this is pretty standard, really. Yeah, and then in this article about this incident, they revealed another incident that has also not really been in the news, which was on Monday, a United Airlines flight was headed from Sydney to San Francisco and was forced to turn around mid-flight due to a fuel leak. Oh my god. I, there, you know what? Honestly, I'm going to say that these things probably happen all the time and they're not really in the news. And the only reason now they're being like overreported is because of all the controversy surrounding Boeing. Yeah. Right? I mean, they're so, totally under the microscope right now. Yeah. So so explain really the biggest story that has to do with Boeing this week. OK, so we're going to circle back a little bit into the story we covered a few weeks ago, which was the Alaskan Airlines flight where the, the door or the wall or plug, whatever they called it, flew off mid-flight, right? And nobody got hurt in that situation. But remember, the boy's shirt was sucked off and people's phones were flying out of the plane. So this incident is really what I feel ignited all of this, you know, fervor about them being analyzed. And like you're saying, that these events probably happen all of the time, but we just aren't hearing about them as much. But now that they're kind of being looked at it's everything they're doing is making news so boeing's video footage showing exactly who worked on that aircraft is just it's missing it's been erased 
They're not necessarily... Surprise, just like Jeffrey Epstein, right? Exactly. It's just not there. So the National Transportation Safety Board believes that the company is trying to hide money. So, you know, now the government's involved, which I feel like, why did it take so long for <laughs> them to get involved? But they're saying that Boeing cannot find any documentation at all regarding who worked on that door plug. Instead, they're just giving them a vague li- list of names of people that reported to the door manager. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, exactly. Real nice. So, as you can recall, when this incident happened in January, they had grounded all models of that Boeing only a couple weeks later to let them back in the air. So, after they started going back in the air, a former Boeing quality manager named John Barnett came forward to disagree with that decision, citing that they had safety issues and were prioritizing money over the safety of his passengers. John Barnett is a whistleblower against Boeing. He worked there for 32 years. He was the quality manager for seven years at a South Carolina plant. And he retired in 2017 and ever since then has been a whistleblower. He filed a lawsuit against Boeing and publicly said they were using faulty parts, malfunctioning emergency systems, which makes us all really feel great, right? So he filed a lawsuit alleging that he was getting retaliation for his whistleblowing efforts. Last week, he sat down for a deposition with Boeing lawyers and his own lawyers, and then on Saturday was found dead of an apparent suicide with a self-inflicted gunshot wound. What is going on? I don't know. And, you know, they're going to have to do an autopsy to determine if he really did, in fact, kill himself. And there is, he does have a history of anxiety, depression, PTSD, but he he didn't it is important to state that he didn't have suicidal ideations which means he didn't say to anybody that he wanted to kill himself he didn't seem like he was in any kind of acute moment of of an episode that would cause him to want to do this and everyone around him his family his lawyers and everyone is actually completely shocked and they did also find a note which can be used to for circumstantial evidence with the case but it doesn't always mean that Because people write fake notes and stuff, right? Yeah. And his family saying that the note doesn't seem like anything that he would ever say in the tone he would talk or write in. So it's pretty interesting. It's just suspicious. You know, we talked about before that a documentary came out in 2022 on Netflix against Boeing. And they were detailing these two Boeing incidents in the last couple of years that resulted in the deaths of three, almost 350 people. And, you know... Their, sa- their issues over safety concerns have been coming up a lot since that documentary came up, but I'm just, I'm just like not feeling good about this, right? When we were booking a trip recently, I was booking through American Airlines and I saw there was an option for a Boeing or an Airbus and I went with the more inconvenient time because of that. Yeah, I understand that totally. And people um, are seeing it too. They've had a 25% dip in their stock in the last year. I mean, I think the same can be said about some circumstances with NASA, too, and with the Challenger happening. And when you look at the documentary from that, and we wrote in the gross room a two-part high-profile death dissection on the Challenger explosion, it's it was all about just money over safety, money over safety. It, it's always like that, you know, and you see this time and time again with every one of these huge accidents. It always has to do something with that. I mean, all I could think is the government's involved now, right? But what are what are we really going to do? Let's say they do this mass investigation and Boeings are going to be put out of service. That's at least 50% of aircrafts are Boeings, right? So travel yeah. is going to be seriously interrupted. What are they going to do to fix these issues? Are they actually going to do a formal investigation and take them to court? Or is this going to be like kind of a slap on the wrist and get your shit together type of deal? cross your fingers and hope nothing happens that seems what's i mean from from the transportation perspective it it seems like you can't just say okay we're getting rid of all your planes like it just physically can't happen so i do understand that they have a lot to deal with too as far as trying to like reel these people in i guess but you also can't you you can't be having citizens get getting hurt because of negligence like it just it can't happen it's not fair to us and you know you travel and unknowingly think that you're that you're on a plane that's been checked and everything and and 
it's just it's just proof that something can go wrong but still it, it's just still we have to emphasize that like this is nowhere compared to the problems that cars have and the amount of people that die in car accidents every day no definitely i think it's just one of those like you know when you hear of a car accident it's it can't it can be fatal, but it doesn't always result in a fatality, right? Well, Whereas you just feel like you have more control. Yeah, over more it. control. Whereas if you hear a plane crash, you immediately are like, okay, hundreds of people just died. Yeah, not they, just not always that. Not always. Not always, but <laughs> it's yeah, it's it's a scary thought to think you're not in control, and the people that are in control just care about making money and not about hundreds or thousands of people's lives. All right, let's get into the celebrity news of the week. So actress Olivia Munn has come forward to announce on Instagram that she was diagnosed with breast cancer and had decided to get a double mastectomy. This this is super good for just educating women in general. I think it's great that she's coming forward and really being detailed about everything that she's gone through for the past couple of years but so she's young she's 43 and most women don't even aren't even considered for breast cancer until they're well older than 43 in fact only like nine percent of people under the age of 45 get diagnosed with breast cancer so the majority is in older postmenopausal women but it does happen in younger people so you can't just you can't blow off the the potential of that happening and so when you turn 40 years old, and I know because I'm, I'm around her age, I'm 44, I'm a year older than her. When you're 40, everyone should go every year and get a mammogram done. But unfortunately, mammograms have, they're not the, the best all the time. So if you have really dense breast tissue or the lesion's really small, it won't pick it up. And you only get those done every year. So she was saying, Olivia Mom was saying that she went to her gynecologist and they did something called calculating your breast cancer assessment risk. And they determined that her risk based upon the questions they asked her. So they ask you really interesting questions and you could actually, I wrote down the name of the website. You can go on there yourself and it's called BC. So BC for breast cancer risk tool.cancer.gov. And you can go on there and take the test and it asks you questions like, do you have a, a first degree relative with breast cancer? Have you ever had a breast biopsy? And then it asks you some really interesting questions like, what was the age of your first pregnancy? And Olivia Munn had said that she had her first child over, how, how was she? She was 30 or over the age of 30? Yeah, I think that kid's a toddler. Yeah, she had it. So she had a kid when she was her first pregnancy was over the age of 30. And that is a risk f factor for breast cancer. So when I did it, I, so I just did it right before we came on today just to see what my score would be. And I don't have a family history of breast cancer like my mom didn't have it, my grandmom didn't have it. The age of my first pregnancy, as everyone knows, was 15 with Maria. And if you have your first child when you're that young, it actually decreases your risk of breast cancer. And then it also asks you, when is the age of your first period? So it will say, were you 11? Were you 12 or 13? So I was 12. So I answered that. And you, you won't believe this, but my risk is only 0.6% for breast cancer. And the average risk is 0.9%. So I'm even less than the average risk. Hers was 37%. Oh, wow. So, yeah. So anytime they say if it's greater than 20%, they want you to get more than what's required at 40 years old, which is a mammogram every year. So they want you to get an MRI and then an ultrasound to be even more specific to make sure that there's no little tiny lesions that they can't see. So I went for my annual GYN appointment the other day, and she told me that last my last mammogram, I had really dense breast tissue, which just means that like the older you get and the more weight you gain, sometimes it could turn more into fat and just dense breast tissue is just like really thick and it's hard for the mammogram to see through it sometimes. So she offered me, she said, I don't know if your insurance covers it, but I would like you to get an ultrasound too, just because it's it's more specific and it could see better than the mammogram. And then we could just like cover all basis and be sure that you're cool for another year. 
Um, and I haven't even like made that appointment yet and figured that out yet, but I'll do that this week. Anyway, um, so yeah, so she was at an increased risk because she had a family history of it, I think, because she got genetic testing done apparently and it was negative. And then, so I'm thinking she probably had a, a cancer history because I don't know if they just do that on people that don't have the history, but apparently that was negative. She had a mammogram and that was negative. And the only reason that she did this extra test was because her doctor said that her assessment was 37%. So she went and got this done, and then she found out that she had this really aggressive form of breast cancer and in both of her breasts, too, and decided on getting a double mastectomy. So a double mastectomy is when they, they completely surgically remove your breasts and your nipples and everything. They just take it off. They could do some surgeries where they like try to save your nipple and things like that. But in my opinion, based upon the hundreds and hundreds of breasts that I've dissected in the pathology lab, I am like kind of if I get breast cancer, like I'm cutting it all off. I just because the only way, in my opinion, that you could get a recurrence of breast cancer is if you have it, if you have breast tissue left. So they try to say that there's studies that if you do treatment on the one and not the other, that it it doesn't it doesn't seem like it's any more increased or decreased with a lumpectomy versus a mastectomy. But I believe the current protocol is if you have it in both breasts that you should get a double mastectomy regardless. So she got that done. And then what happens with that is that it leaves you flat chested like a man, basically. And then you have to get reconstructive surgery. So she said since last year, since she got diagnosed with this, she's had, I think, four surgeries now. So those additional surgeries are one is to remove the breast. Then the next one is to try to, the next ones are try to recreate the breast and make them look like more natural, like a female figure. Um, And, you know, Angelina Jolie did this too. She had a double mastectomy and reconstruction because she tested positive for the gene. I don't even believe that she had the cancer, but her mom died from ovarian cancer due to BRCA, I believe. Um, so yeah, so this is what's happening with her now. So she's going, they, what's cool now is they do this like molecular testing on these tumors and they can tell exactly what kind of treatment to give these people that will give them the best chance of getting rid of the cancer. And so, so she has said that she's learned more about hormones and more about everything since she's been diagnosed. She was diagnosed with something called group two or luminal B, which is a tumor that's estrogen positive, progesterone negative, and HER2 positive. So they found that these tumors, when they're treated with something to target the HER2, that you can really get rid of it. And she could have a really good prognosis after this, hopefully if it was caught early enough. Yeah, I mean, it's really, I'm sure this whole experience was really scary, but it was probably the best call she could have made. We'll definitely put that website in the episode description so it's a good resource tool for anybody listening. Um, it's really. Uh, yeah, it's free and you just, it's very easy to answer. There was just very clear cut answers and you could really print out your results. And it, if it's, if it's 20% or greater, I would print that out and bring it to your doctor and just say, I want a further workup. And most insurance companies take that as as a cue that you're allowed to get additional things covered in addition to the screening. Yeah. So we'll definitely put that in there. All right. Let's get on to freak accidents. So this couple threw a party at their home in Australia to celebrate their engagement. And the guy slipped, fell, cut his neck, and then died in front of his fiance and friends and family that were at this party. It, what are I, I they don't really get into detail of what happened, but he basically exsanguinated, so he cut his carotid artery and just bled out all over the place and didn't even make it to the hospital. The worst part of this story is after this came out, his his fiance said that she was pregnant. Oh my god. That's I know. Absolutely. It's, it's just so terrible. Like, can you imagine going through that? It's nuts. No. So next we have a story about a 33-year-old mother of five died after getting a BBL by a Miami doctor who wasn't allowed to operate. So she traveled to this seduction cosmetic center in Miami from Tennessee in 2021 to undergo the cosmetic procedure. 
The doctor had performed seven procedures that day, and she was the last of which to happen at 8.30 p.m. Don't you think that's an unusual time for a scheduled procedure? I don't really know. I just feel like everybody I know that gets a surgery, it happens at like 6 o'clock in the morning. Yeah, I mean, we talked about this before, that there's these clinics that are pumping these things out way too many in a day. He did seven in one day. Like, I feel like that already is just irresponsible. That was the 14th hour of his shift, and two hours after the procedure began, the woman went into cardiac arrest and died. So this is interesting because they describe how she died, and it's, it's even more disturbing than the typical botched BBL, which is... The, so they use this cannula to, to suck fat in, out and to inject fat back into the the rear end. And when they were when he was doing this liposuction procedure, he actually went from the outside of her body inside of her body. So he like poked it through inside of her body and punctured her liver, her bladder, and her intestines with the cannula. So when he was sucking fat and pushing fat in he was actually punctured into her abdominal and pelvic cavity which is so crazy to me because the bladder and the liver are kind of nowhere near each other so it just means that he did it maybe on multiple occasions or just stuck it in so far and thought he was in the plane of above the the skin or above the cavities and he was in the cavities so not only did she die from massive bleed because he punctured her organs but she also had fat traveling into her lungs that killed her as well, which is called a fat embolus. But like this is on some other level of of inexperience. And it's scary because she probably found this guy online. Six other people got surgery by him that day. God knows how many he's done. And as a normal person that just goes to doctors, like you think, how is this even possible that you're going to a doctor that they're performing surgeries at at centers and hospitals and now it comes down to he fudged paperwork like they they can't they can't look into that any further it's a little scary yeah so what happened was in 2020 the facility falsified documents to the Florida Health Department saying that this guy was a quote designated physician so basically his job was to ensure the facility was complying with health and safety standards and requirements, right? It said nothing about surgery. In fact, in June of that year, he provided the state's health department with a letter stating specifically that he did not perform surgical procedures there. So despite all this paperwork, he did go on to perform several procedures from April of 2021 until this incident in June of 2021. And they're saying since September of 2022, He's been restricted from performing gluteal fat grafting procedures and is serving as the designated physician of the surgery center. I, what, I don't know what Why to say. Why is he employed? Like, I, I, I don't know because, because there's no standards anymore with anything. Like that's just all it is. I don't know. No. So I, it's so it's just I mean, the, and this lady like I mean, take getting getting cosmetic surgery anyway everybody just needs to know that that's just such a risk as it is and i mean she she didn't die like there's some risks that you can't prevent just your body didn't take it if as long as the doctor does everything right you you don't feel as bad about that but then it's because of negligence it's just it's just it's not fair and it's not fair these kids don't have a mom now it's just really sad yeah so This next one kind of happened to us a little bit. So a couple weeks ago, we mentioned we were at a car wash. And when we were on the way out, the the buffer thing at the very end, like kept bouncing the car back, but the car behind us was getting increasingly close. So I'm like telling my husband this and he's like, no, you just don't understand. And I was like, I understand. We were trapped for a second. We were we were trapped. And on top of that, I, so when that happened, my first thing was like, holy shit, this thing is going to crush through my windshield yeah. and we're going to die from blunt trauma. But Maria was saying that she thought that the car was going to smush behind us and like in, like entrap us in between the, the roller thing and and the other car. And it actually it it broke my windshield wipers, too, which was a whole other drama that we were dealing with last week. But um, just just to. um give you a little bit of the story of that because it's kind of funny. I brought my car to the dealership 
And they tried to tell me that it was $5,000 to fix my windshield wipers. Absolutely that the motor, ridiculous. The motor was broke and this, that, and the other. It was like $4,980, something ridiculous, right? I come home and I, t I tell my brother and he looks up the parts that they said and the parts weren't even weren't even a thousand dollars. So he's like, let me see. Like, I'll look at it and I'll fix it and we'll just order the parts and I'll fix it. Right. My brother goes outside last week. It was actually while we were recording Mother Knows Death. He was outside working on my car and he comes in when we were on break and he says, oh, I fixed it. And he fixed it with a dollar twenty five bolt that was missing that had screwed off. I'm not lying to you that this happened last week. So I, lo I love my brother and it's awesome that he was able to fix that, but I'm so pissed off th about that. I mean, that was ridiculous. And that was ridiculous. Anyway, so we're losing track. So in this particular car wash injury that this woman had, the same thing happened. The thing went through the windshield and broke her windshield and she had injury because of it. Yeah. You know, I was thinking when we were in it, you know, you were like worried the thing was going to come forward and crush the windshield, but I was seeing it as a final destination situation where the car was going to come up behind us and then the thing was going to come down and like crush from both ends because the employees are like literally not paying attention at they're all They're all high every it, one of them it's not even high. about all being high they're just, they're literally not paying attention well you know what's crazy so the the car wash that gabe goes to they don't let people in the car wash which is why i don't go there because i don't want to get out of my That's car how right I feel and the kids and the kids like well now i'm scared i guess i don't know but the kids like going through the car wash and everything but there are lots of car washes that don't let humans go through, and it's probably why, because there are injuries reported. And I saw that there was a couple OSHA reports of car wash deaths. Um, we did talk about one, didn't we, with a, a girl that worked at one, and she got caught in Oh, something. yeah, her hair got pulled in the one of the yeah. mechanisms. Yeah. Or it, yeah, something. She had a scalp injury or something, and then we figured it was her hair got caught into Honestly, it. Honestly, I was going to go there yesterday when I left your house. And I was like, I'm going to just wait and go to you have another one close to you where the one Gabe goes to, I think, where you don't get out or where you get out. And I think I'm just no, going to do I that from it. now on. I don't want to get out. I don't know that. I feel like I get like sexually stalked by the workers there. I don't something. know. I They're just like always staring at me. I it's just so feel awkward. like I don't want to be in that position. And I especially don't want to be alone if something like that happens. No, totally. But the the lady ended up. You know, she had, she had injuries, but she's okay, so. Yeah, so, I mean, but she could have had blunt injuries if that thing smushed on her. or It probably was more due to the glass breaking. And the on most windshields of any modern car, the, the glass is tempered, so it can't cause, like, huge incisional slashes across your neck and things like that. But you could still get hurt from the glass. That So that's probably what happened. All right, next, a 19-year-old who was a quarter mile away from an explosion was struck in the head and killed by a canister that flew from the blast, which is absolutely crazy. So, butane containers caught fire on Monday night at a vaping distribution company about 25 miles outside of Detroit. So, the vape company had recently re received a semi-load of butane containers and over half of that was still at the facility when the explosion occurred they also had pallets of nitrous and lighter fluid and over a hundred thousand vape pens with um the lithium batteries which we've talked about at length they are a huge problem so combine all these really horrible ingredients together and boom massive massive explosion firefighters said it was one of the worst ex fires and explosions they've ever seen in that area the, the firefighter said that, that a piece of it hit their windshield and broke their windshield and, and hit a firefighter and injured them. It's so, it, this is the thing, like all of those people living around there probably had no idea about what's going on at this factory, right? And it, it's so scary because it's, it's essentially like the kid got shot with something huge going that fast and, and like a shrapnel injury. It's, it's crazy. And it was enough to kill him. So yeah, and they it said probably hit him in the head or could have caused a large laceration somewhere in his abdominal cavity or severed some kind of vessel it's just so nuts yeah they said the debris field was about half a mile away and people one to two miles from the blast could feel it feel it happen oh. so that's absolutely crazy but they were saying though that the company was doing everything right they like they were doing everything legal they're still doing an investigation as to how the fire broke out but it's not like you know they had all this illegal stuff in there and they were doing something shady so they're still trying to look up what the cause of the fire was, but they are cooperating, which is nice because I feel like a lot of <laughs> incidents lately, people are certainly not. 
This episode is brought to you by CrimeCon. We said we were going to be at CrimeCon and you guys could come and meet us. It's so exciting. Yeah, you're going to be doing a lecture. We're going to be doing a live podcast. It's going to be so exciting. It's also in my favorite place ever, Tennessee. So from May 31st to June 2nd, you can go to Nashville, Tennessee and go to the central place for true crime and mystery. CrimeCon has been slowly rolling out their guest speakers and some podcasts that are going to be there. So if you go on the CrimeCon Instagram, it's at CrimeCon. You could check out every week they're announcing some new people and fun activities. So for example, a couple weeks ago, they announced Chris Hansen of To Catch yes. a Predator fame is going to be there. <laughs> it's like our favorite. Your That's like our childhood bonding show we had together. Oh, right? yeah. <laughs> we are so excited. We can't even tell you. We're kind of fangirling out about that one a little bit. Maya Kowalski is also going to be there. We've talked about her case on here. There's a couple podcasts going too. Wonder East Generation Y. That's an awesome show. And now Mother Knows Death is also going to be there. So, you know, you guys need to hurry up and go to their website, though, because the gold and platinum tickets are sold out and the standard passes are also almost sold out. So you definitely want to rush over there. If you happen to not get there in time, you could join a waiting list. You could also join their free mailing list for any announcements and updates. That's crimecon.com slash email. So, you know, we are very excited to go. This is an awesome opportunity. We are excited to meet all of you guys and just some like minded people, you know, people in your life are not always accepting of your love of true crime, but this is the one place where everybody will be on the same page. So you want to head over to Instagram at CrimeCon and follow them for any possible updates or join their free mailing list at CrimeCon.com slash email. All right, let's get started with violent crime. So two women who were 55 and 63 years old found their 80-year-old roommate dead and decided to take on kind of a weekend at Bernie's situation. So they find this guy dead and they're like, you know what? We took him to a bank a while ago. So let's go back to the bank and steal all his money now that he's dead. So they take his body, they put it in a car and they go through the drive through at the bank and the bank teller sees this guy in the car and they give these women the money and then they drive off. Right. And then they dump his body at some medical center and they're like, we don't know what happened. He's dead. <laughs> Was I want to see the footage. And was he wearing a Hawaiian shirt and sunglasses? I'm just asking. Like, literally, this is so <laughs> ridiculous. So they they drop him off at this medical center. They leave quickly. They give the staff no information. So obviously that sets off a million red flags, right? So then the investigators go to question them, and they immediately admitted to what they've done. Do you think that th I'm pretty sure they probably plan this ahead of time? Like, oh, bro's getting old. Like, let's do this when he dies if we find him dead. I don't I don't think right now they haven't said anything that like was suspicious about his death. I, I They will do an autopsy on him to see if they like actually killed him or if he really just died of natural causes. But it's still a little creepy. And there is a third person involved that allegedly helped them put the body in the car. But that's that person's been unnamed. But these two women have been charged with abusing a corpse. So very, very interesting. Okay, this next story is really crazy and all over the place. So two men in Georgia were arrested in February 2023 on charges of setting off a homemade bomb at the home of a woman with whom one of them had a previous relationship. That's not it. So they were indicted on multiple federal charges related to a January 13th bombing and their alleged plot, which included mailing dog feces to the ex's home and releasing a python in her residence to eat her daughter and attempted they wanted to scalp her as well it's so random right like what who who these two guys are sitting around like plotting this and they thought these this was a good idea a python is not the most dangerous snake in america that i would use to do that i they're i they're actually this made me think about there's a case in the gross room a video we have that is titled lunch you should really look that up and i believe it took place in like indonesia or something there was a giant python that ate a, a woman that and the video shows the snake getting cut open and taking the woman out of the snake's belly there's no snakes of that anywhere near that size in america i'm sure you could get one if you stole one from a zoo or something but like i don't think you could just go to a pet store and get a python that big and they're not venomous so they can wrap around a person and they can squeeze them to death and that's how they usually kill their prey like that but i just think it's silly 
I, I don't know how old the daughter was either because they didn't really say that, right? No. But I think I think it's just kind of like a random snake, like, oh, I'm going to get a house cat to kill a person or something. Like, there's just, there's a lot more dangerous animals if you really wanted to do that route. It's just so idiotic. Like, they had this lady under surveillance from December to January, and then they made a homemade bomb and, ex- like, you know, exploded her house, and then she wasn't even injured in it, and neither was the dog. I don't even think they were home when it happened. So it's like, what are you even doing? <laughs> and, and you know, they were immediately caught. They're saying, the police are saying that the conspiracy charges can carry up to a sentence of 20 years and then they could get an additional 10 years. So they're only really facing 30 years, which I really feel like isn't enough if you blow somebody's house up intentionally and you foil this whole, you plan this whole thing to like, you know, kill their kid mail them With dog a snake. shit it, they, they just sound like morons like i don't really want these people entering society after <laughs> this so mainly because they're so dumb not because not because they tried to do this right yeah i mean it's just kind of like there has to be there has to be a greater charge for attempted murder right because you were you were going to do it. You just didn't do a good job. Yeah, basically. you, you, you so. just sucked at it. You should actually get charged more because you're not good at it. All right. Yeah. So that that could actually lead us into this next story about people going to jail and serving their time and getting out and what they do with their life when they do that. So this guy, Sheldon Johnson, was an ex-convict turned into a criminal justice activist. So he worked for a public law firm called Queens Defenders and was even featured on Joe Rogan to talk about it. So. You know, this guy was pretty notable in his, you know, life change experience. So now he has been arrested after his prison rival's dismembered body was found and he was on security cameras entering his apartment right before. (laughs) So not a good look. So his his all the people in the building. Did you read all the comments mm -hmm. by the people in the building? It seems like they were watching the whole thing unfold Uh, uh, the guy went into the apartment and then he left and then he came back with cleaning supplies and just they they watched the whole thing but it's kind of cool that the neighbors were like yo something weird is going on over here because it wasn't nothing that was really outwardly suspicious except we'll tell them what he looked like when he left well wait you're leaving out a huge gap so there's like a lot of questions i have in this because You know, the neighbors are saying that they heard two men arguing and one of them was begging for his life and then they heard two gunshots. And then the super checks the security footage and sees this guy that's not the tenant entering and leaving the apartment and calls the police for a welfare check. So it seems like when the police first got to the apartment, the 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 killer opened the door and talked them out of looking into it further and said because they got the call they had to check. And then and then this guy calls the super and is like i want to talk to you so the super's kind of like shitting his pants like i don't know what's going to happen but i'll just tell the police (laughs) whatever he says to me like you're not in danger too right so then before they were able to meet up the police went back and then that's when they discovered the dismembered body oh yeah so his body was in a tupperware like one of those tupperware bins his torso yeah, so it just said torso though. It did well. Well, I his guess head that... was in a freezer, and his torso was in this blue bin. So this guy's on surveillance, leaving and going multiple times. He's like coming back with a mop and cleaning supplies, and then he comes back with a blue bin that never leaves. Obviously, because the guy's torso's in it. Now we know. And then the third time he's seen coming back, he's wearing a blonde wig, like. A Halloween like a store. woman's <laughs> yes, wig. it was straight up like Halloween, like a Barbie Barbie wig from last season. But I'm thinking like, okay, I understand people want to go in disguises, but wouldn't you think something was more up if you saw like a grown man wearing a woman's like Barbie wig in the? Uh, it's of it's Barbie. you have to see you have to go on the story and look at it because it's so outrageous it sticks out like a sore thumb. But the more important question is though is like. So he's been this victim's rights activist, right, for, or not victim's right, but for criminal justice reform, I'm assuming. Like, he's trying to say how great people's lives can be when they get out of prison and how they can turn their life around. Like, this is not good for business, bro. Not good for business at all. No, not good at all. And, you know, he stole his car on top of it. So then when he returned, he returned in an Uber, and then that's when he had the blonde wig. And you're like... 
you don't live in this day and age where you just assume everywhere you go is under surveillance, right? Even if you don't physically see a camera. It is. And it's it's some of these stories that are really crazy. You you think like, oh, my God, I would really, you know, that's a good idea for a website is just to have like surveillance videos of these stories because they're just they're really crazy. Yeah. So. All right. Next story. 1030 a.m. on Saturday morning, a woman and her boyfriend were getting in an argument when he allegedly pushed her in front of the train in Manhattan. She was 29 years old and has to now have both of her feet amputated after being pushed onto the tracks and being struck by the train. So actually, she got pushed onto the tracks and the train amputated her feet. Oh, I misread that. I thought she got hit and had to, I thought she had injuries sustained from getting hit. No. And then, oh my God. And and, and one one of the interesting mechanisms when you get hit by a train is that the, it's so hot, the track, that when it cuts off your limb, it cauterizes the vessels and it it's actually works as kind of a tourniquet to keep you from bleeding. Wow. Uh, your feet getting cut off, you could eventually bleed to death, but it would take longer just because the vessels are smaller, further away from your heart. But like if it was at the thighs, that would be an immediate bleeding concern because the femoral artery could really bleed out really bad quickly and you could die fast from that. Um, but yeah, it, it, it kind of blocks off the, the arteries and she goes to the hospital and, and possibly needed a transfusion, but she had clear cut amputations of both of her feet. Like how, I, I don't even understand how you could ever forgive something like that. And I mean, obviously they're not in a great relationship because clearly your loved one, boyfriend, partner, whatever, doesn't usually push you onto the train tracks. And when you do something like that, you're assuming he did that because he wanted her to get hit by a train, right? So that's like another attempted murder situation. He also fled the scene and wasn't arrested till nine o'clock that night. So nearly 12 hours later and he was only caught because he went to meet with his parole officer. What a dick. What a douche. Like, so so he pushed her and saw her get injured and bleeding there and obviously saw how traumatic that looked. She was probably wide awake and screaming and everything else. And, and he left her like, what a douche. I mean, yeah, the, he is. He's a douche for the entire situation <laughs> and an yeah. idiot. Uh, for surprised thinking... he has a parole officer. But like. If you just committed a crime of this level, why even meet the parole officer? Like, you're not even, you know, you're not even going to think about it. They're not going to put two and two together. You're in trouble. Yeah. And again, this is probably all on surveillance. Okay. Next, a mom and nurse has been arrested after giving her son a drink to prevent bullying. So an 11-year-old student allegedly stole a drink belonging to this lady's son. The boy went home, told the mom, who then combined lemon salt and vinegar into a sports bottle saying next time he takes it really like he'll learn his lesson right so the contents were not toxic but the child that was bullying her son did take the drink drank it and was hospitalized i i don't know i keep going back i this is going to be really messed up to say but i I keep going really back and forth to this like i if if you have like a tablespoon of vinegar which is they, I, I just actually read some study that about apple cider vinegar and weight loss and and taking a tablespoon of vinegar. It could give you, it, it could give you acid reflux, but also sometimes it's used for acid reflux. But also, like taking a tablespoon of ving- vinegar isn't going to really hurt anybody. And but I I think it's not cool to give to like give kids something that they don't know that they're drinking it it probably tasted bad really bad and then the kid wanted to throw up just because of the bad taste but I don't really necessarily think that the kid was injured I just I just don't buy that yeah he said he developed a headache and nausea and because they didn't know what was in the drink that's why they brought him to the hospital yeah, that's that was that was all just emotional I don't really think he had any physical it, it's like he drank salad dressing come on like a, and a sip of it it's not how much did he possibly drink yeah and but I, I mean come on it's it's like it's she shouldn't have did it but I don't think I don't think it should be like she poisoned my son like simmer down no exactly because it's saying she's charged with injury to a child causing bodily harm but she said she mm-hmm. was she's a nurse and she said she knew it was non-toxic she just wanted the kid to stop fucking with her son 
I, I just can't get behind being angry, this angry about this. Like, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it, but I don't, I, I don't know. If you, if you said it was salad dressing, if I re said it was salad dressing mixed with Gatorade, would you be, would you be mad about it? Like, no, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of like, I think sometimes you got to teach a kid a lesson because they're being a douche. I don't know. Like, now I don't know. Maybe she put a whole bottle of vinegar in a Stanley cup and, and the kid like, drank a lot of it somehow but I just I don't think that that's what what really happened I think that it, he was probably like what the hell was that because if you ever have drank straight vinegar it, it's a shock to the system he's a kid he probably never had it and was like what is this um and 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 like yeah maybe thought he was poisoned right like yeah I mean I understand why they wanted to send him to the hospital but if they know for a fact that those were the ingredients then I don't understand why she was charged, but I don't know. It, it, th I, I, I just, I don't know either because I'm thinking like, could, because I guess what is, was in the drink is the kid, if, if you want to talk from a legal perspective, the kid thought it was juice, even though he was stealing it from another kid and he thought it was juice and really it was salad dressing. And that's not really something that you would drink typically. So he got duped into drinking something that a person wouldn't normally drink, I guess. Yeah. Okay, on to medical stories. So a 52-year-old man in Florida was thought to be suffering from severe migraines but was actually battling a bizarre tapeworm infestation in his brain, which was caused by undercooked bacon. Yeah, they they I I love in the story they said somebody call a ambulance. Get oh it? Oh my god! <laughs> but at, so actually, the next three stories we have this week are talking about people eating weird shit and getting weird parasites or uh, toxins. But so the first case that we're talking about is a pork tapeworm, and this is why they tell you to cook pork. You don't really ever serve pork raw because you can ingest these the larva or you can inject it in the actual meat that you eat and it, apparently he liked to eat really soft bacon it said and so you could get it a, d a couple different ways you could get it from actually ingesting pork that has it in there or you can get it if a person in your house is pooping and not wiping and washing properly and somehow you touch something like a fecal oral transmission and you touch something and ingest the eggs by accident and it causes a tapeworm, which is, this is just really nasty, like that you ingest the eggs and then it the, the worm starts to grow inside your body and travels its way up into your brain and then kind of insists itself, meaning like a cyst forms around this worm inside of your brain. And so it's it's actually worldwide, it's the number one cause of of seizures in people because this happens in other countries all the time, especially ones that don't that have poor sanitation. But in America, there's only like a thousand hospitalizations a year for this. So it's just not common. And the way to just avoid this is to just cook your pork all the way. You can't you can't serve it raw just because there's a rare chance that this could happen and that's why they tell you to do that. But um, he he was suffering like severe migraines and see this is why why I think it would be so cool to be well it's obviously it's cool to do autopsy and to to do surgical pathology but in this case we wouldn't see anything in a patient like this so I think it would be cool as a radiologist to have okay this guy came into the emergency room he's having these debilitating migraines and you do the imaging and then you could see this on in their brain and it like that must be kind of cool from a scientific perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this kind of leads us into our next story too, which is a mom found a huge parasitic worm in two year old daughter's diaper, which the CDC claimed she caught from pigs on her family's farm. So again, this happens it happened in America. I, I had a case working um in Philadelphia with this one time. A, a really years ago um, of a patient that had a scara. So it, th that's a round worm, very, but it looks like a big worm. Like they're really disturbing looking when you see them inside of a human. And apparently the mom was changing this baby's diaper and saw the worm in the diaper and she threw it out and they did some work up and they found that like, maybe that was the only one that she had. It, the, the mom caught it really early, but they said that the, the two-year-old also has a twin and they enjoyed eating household plant dirt, 
which um, they I'm assuming they were probably getting the dirt from their backyard, though, which is where pigs are pooping. And that's where they picked up the eggs and ingested them. And really, if your kid's sitting there, like, I'm not one of these germaphobes at all. Trust me. Like, I think kids could eat dirt and it's fine and all. This is just like a rare thing. But you also shouldn't really encourage your kid or just ignore if they're just sitting there eating handfuls of dirt. And you might want to even go get them checked for nutritional deficiencies if they're eating things that aren't considered food. Um, but yeah, that I, I just thought that that was really interesting that the kids just like, yeah, her kids just sit there and eat dirt. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> but I, I also just picture it's probably hard. You know, we have a lot of plants, so I imagine it's really hard if you have a toddler that's just, you know, just you could turn your head for one second and then they already have a handful of it yeah. in their mouth. I, I just think, though, it, it, like thinking of that, of all the plants in the house and stuff, especially for me, like I put a lot of I don't they're chemicals like plant food and things like that and sprays or like I don't want my kids putting that stuff in their mouth. So I would be frowning upon that. No, definitely. So next is a story I never thought we'd really be talking about, which is about consuming sea turtle meat. So. Nine people have died, which was eight children and one adult, and 78 other people were hospitalized after eating sea turtle meat on Pemba Island last Tuesday. Sea turtle meat is considered a delicacy there, and even though it periodically results in deaths. So explain what this food poisoning that the sea turtle meat could give people and why it's so dangerous. So this is called shilinotoxism, and it is... It, it seems like they don't really 100% know the mechanism because it's it's kind of rare, but they think that it's a neurotoxin, which means that it could, it's it's almost probably like Botox is a, nor, a neurotoxin too if you have botulism, right? So what happens is a, a few hours or even days after you ingest the meat, you can become nauseous, vomiting, diarrhea, and the autopsy in these people have shown lots of different things. One of them is liver necrosis. So that's when the, the liver is actually dying or dead. And um, one of the interesting things about this, though, is that since uh, obviously there's not a ton of people that eat this meat and and die and it's in a rare part of the country and they don't just they just don't have a lot of studies on it, that they had the patients that died from this, they would take out their stomach contents after autopsy and feed the stomach contents to animals to see what would happen. And the animals died. Wow. Yeah. Like that's, that's really some science right there. Right. So, um, I, I don't know. It, it, it's, it's more, it's more specific to injure children and, in this case, it was the nine people that died. Was it nine people? Nine died? people, yeah. but it was eight and, kids and one adult. Yeah. yeah, and eight of them were kids. So it is it is known that it's more toxic to children. So if you if that's out there and it's like this is a delicacy, I have a once in a chance lifetime. At least you eat it, making a, a consent choice as an adult. But like, don't feed it to little kids. That's because not only do they not have a choice and they don't understand it, plus it probably tastes nasty as hell. <laughs> That's but what like, I, I, I am not interested in trying turtle at all. I just feel like it would be so slimy and disgusting. Not, not slimy, just like, I don't know. I just think it would be like, I, I've never had any, anything like that though. Any kind of like reptile or, or amphibian meat, but it just, it would be like more like, like meat, like pork meat, but fishy. Like, I don't know. I just feel like it just has this weird, like. I have just, gross cross turtles skeeve me out so bad. I feel like when people have them in their houses, they just they stink. Like no matter what people do, they just have this weird odor. I can't explain it, and just the thought of eating them is so disgusting to me. It's, it's a delicacy, though. But they're saying this, so this isn't an isolated event. Like there's known dangers behind eating this. And in November of 2021, seven people had died after on the same island after eating. Turtle me and three others were hospitalized as well. So I think the key Are here... they not getting the memo or like what's happening yeah, there? So they're saying they sent officials there to beg people to stop eating it, but it's like who is surfing it? I, I don't know. They're probably taking it out of the water themselves and killing it and eating it. It's not like I would say it's not at a restaurant. Yeah. So this I mean, don't don't eat it. Just don't eat turtle. <laughs> so okay. Next we have um 
People are getting plastic surgery to copy filtered images of themselves on social media, a new study claim. Um, I would say this is really not shocking information for me. I actually find that people that get a lot of plastic surgery end up using these filters even more. And I don't know. I just feel like it feeds into this whole like body dysmorphia thing. Yeah, th- I don't I I have a rule that I don't I don't use filters because I just want every single person that ever meets me in real life to be like, oh, you look exactly the same as you, as you do right now. And well, do you, do you remember that time that you did you were just like messing around with that one and it made you look like a completely different person and you sent it to mom mom and then she was like, oh, you look great. And you're like, thanks. That's actually not what I look like at all. When I was on my bachelorette trip, me and my friends were using Facetune, but I was doing it on all of the like the highest possible filters you could do to like like we were peeing our pants laughing in bed. Like we went to the wax museum in um in Nashville and I took a picture with like the Timothy McGraw wax figure and I facetuned the wax figure and myself and I was like, this looks like a Midwestern couple that sneak cigarettes in their minivan while their kids are playing. <laughs> soccer like i i was doing the most extreme filters but i sent one to mama but she was like gorgeous and i'm like holy shit i look nothing like th-. yeah you're like you're like thanks yeah <laughs> thanks for th- encouraging this but this was the publish uh this was published in the journal of clinical and aesthetic dermatology and it's it's really cool like all the different things that they studied so they looked at people that were looking it was mostly for snapchat and instagram and they were looking at like people that followed influencers that talked about plastic surgery were more likely to get these procedures done and it's just the the more hours they were spending on it every week and there was just like a lot of different things that they were using and then they were saying that people using filters like facetune and stuff all the time and you see it like sometimes i see people like Chris Jenner is a perfect example. Sometimes she does these filters on her face. And I'm like, are you really trying to let people like think that that you look anything like that? That it's it's so disturbing how distorted people's minds are. I've seen it with Madonna. Well, um, you don't even follow housewives because they're the number one offenders of this. And many of them have excessive plastic surgery. And on top of that, are face tuning to the maximum. Teresa Guiadice being one of the main offenders of this, but I just I really th- I think it's disturbing because when you when you're showing me a picture of yourself, you want me to believe that that's that that's you and that's right right. It's 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 so fraud. And but who is believing that? Well, actually, this can go with the Kate Middleton pictures, right? It's like we're not believing what you're telling us here right now, right? It's like. Well, that's even her. The, this the scandal happening with Kate is even less obvious. You know, like there, that that picture, the family picture they released of her to a trained photo editor. You know, like screams AI, right? Like it's not even Photoshop. It just screams like they uploaded a picture of each of them, and it generated this picture just based on little things. And you and I were even talking about the other day how. Kim Kardashian was photographed at the Vanity Fair Oscars party and you noticed in one picture that a publication posted of her that her skin looked badly and I noticed yesterday that she posted a picture advertising her skincare line of a close-up shot of her face and when I zoom in I can see like where the pixels have been altered right but I am also but that's cool but i'm like you're trained. telling people to buy your stuff and it's just like and your skin don't really look like that that's kind of gross you like, can look because at that if picture. you looked at like i'm saying like if you look at her real skin she's like my age i'm not going to be like like oh god i want my skin to look like yours let me buy your stuff because certainly i would not if you looked at that picture you probably wouldn't be able to tell that it was photoshop but because i am a trained photo editor i know what the differences look like with me saying that her editors do a really good job but I could just see where the changes have been made on her skin based on how certain tones shift and everything like that so you know I think that the the biggest example of this study is think of think of Darcy and Stacy from 90 Day Fiance right they're these they're these twin sisters that were on the show 
they are somebody that were using excessive face tuning, like straight up looked like anime characters. Yeah. And you're like, what are they doing? And they're beautiful women. And then they go and they get all this surgery done. They look absolutely horrible. And then they use the filters on top of now having spent thousands and thousands of dollars on this plastic surgery. And if that's what they want to look like, go for it. But like, I think it's just feeding into this whole body mis you know what i'm talking about like just yeah, yeah body dysmorphia. dysmorphia um i don't know it's at the end of the day like people can do whatever they want and look like how they want but you know some of these people are posting images on instagram and i think they think this like cartoon character version of themselves is what they really look like and then they get mad at other people for posting like unedited photos of them and it's just it's just kind of nuts which is not which is just not possible, especially when there's paparazzi and stuff. Like, they, they take pictures of you. They're not going to sit there and face tune it for hours. It's just... I And, and this goes on because th- the kids always say they want to get the Snapchat just so they can do the, the videos and stuff. And I'm like, absolutely not. Because you don't need to be looking at yourself, like, as a different person or what you would look like as a boy or what you would look like as a grown woman or all these things. It's just not... It's not good for your mental thing to take out your zits and make your skin look perfect and make your eyes look bigger and all these things. It's just not good, especially for little girls growing up to to be looking at that kind of stuff. Don't you agree? Yeah, totally. And, you know, like when I was in photo school and learning how to do that type of editing, I, you know, did it on pictures of myself. I'm not going to do it on a picture of a stranger. That's like kind of fucked up. So like I would take a picture of myself and just be like, how far can I go with this and make it look as natural as possible? And it's really hard to do it naturally. Again, like I want to stress that if people want to do this because they it makes them feel good about themselves, let them do it. But I think in the case of what we were talking about with Kim Kardashian, I mean, I like I I like her as a person. We do talk shit on her sometimes. I I'm not like a hater of her. I respect her as a business person. But I think we all need to have some level of knowledge that she's certainly not using her own skincare products, and it's kind of fucked up to then doctor your face to make it look like your skincare is making your skin look flawless when we know her skin is not that flawless wasn't there some kind this is what i'm asking is as far as like far false advertisement like wasn't there some kind of thing with taco bell recently that they weren't putting like as much meat as they advertised in their taco or you've seen like reese's is not putting as much and it's false advertisement it's not real cheese or whatever mac and cheese all these things so can't the same be said about like you're se- selling this skincare and saying that it makes your skin look a certain way, which you're, which it does not. Like that that photo is not what your skin looks like. You're editing it. It's false advertisement to me, personally. Yeah, it really is. And you know, like, like if I was ever approached about having a skincare line, like my skin looks like shit in person, but your skin looks very nice up close in person. Like even. Even, I would even buy skincare from Ricky's skin. I mean, he... Your skin doesn't look like shit in person. Please, like, don't be dramatic. I know. I'm just saying, There's like, no way that you look like this right now and it looks like shit in person. Yeah, like, but what just... I'm getting at is, like, when I think of somebody that has flawless skincare, I think of, like, like if you see pictures, or not even pictures, if you watch videos, because that's way harder to edit skin, yeah. right? If you watch a video of JLo, for example, her skin looks very nice up close without yeah. anything on. But then she's going through this bullshit of like, all I put is olive oil on my face. Like oh, nobody God. believes you. But what I'm getting at is, I, if she I was just to get so annoyed by that, you're like, okay, re- oh really? Like that's just bullshit. These people are using like hundreds of dollars of lotions and creams and well, procedures you know and facials. Like it's possible that she just puts olive oil on her face because you know what I mean. That's possible. But she also had a facelift, like. Right. That's it's not like I just look like this. You have to listen to how they word things because it is possible because I could even say that like my grandma and stuff like the texture of her skin like she never had when, when she was 80 years old. She started getting wrinkles and stuff, but her skin, especially like where it was smooth, it like you couldn't see a pore on her skin. So it it is possible. But like. Like, if Nanny had a facelift every 10 years, like, her skin would have looked, the texture would have looked nice with maybe just olive oil. Like, that's possible. Yeah, and I, you know, I look at Ricky's face all the time, and I'm like, F you for not having any pores. <laughs> like, I'm so jealous. 
pictures of his perfect skin. I tell him every single day because it's he just has like beautiful skin. I mean, you probably aren't looking at his face for that long, but like, I'm not. <laughs> I don't stare at his pores. Sorry, He's, he has perfect. All right, pores. so get, getting on to like talking about something like trashy skin looking stuff. Um, self tanning nosing spray exists apparently, and I'm kind of I've always been like in. They're always trying to come up with safe ways to tan your skin. And I'm trying to come up with a way to say, like, your skin looks really nice, really pal. Um, but I, I don't think people are going to follow what I say instead of a uh, Kardashian or whatever. But I think um, this is called the Barbie drug and it's illegal. So let's get started with that. But it's, it's some also, kind it's of... It's a nasal spray. You said nosing spray, which is so Did funny. I? Oh, my God. Sorry. Because I meant nose spray and nasal spray at the same time. So a, a, nas- a nasal spray. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, so it's it's illegal, though. So let's let's state that. So this, this woman took it, and what it does is, well, it's kind of cool. When they were coming up with the technology for this drug, they they found out for in early research for whatever, the researcher decided to inject two times the amount of this drug into his body. And when he did, it caused him to have a, a long-term erection for at least eight hours. Oh, my God. So they were like, oh, this is some m- miracle drug. So then it was originally marketed as, like, sexual dysfunction, erectile dysfunction drug. and But the side effects are terrible. They well, they well And it also has been found that it causes your skin to have, like, uh, irregular pigmentation, which makes it look tan. But there's so many negative side effects to this, and it could ha- it could hurt cardiovascular health. It causes nausea, vomiting, and to the point where they they don't want people to take it. That's why it's illegal. But this lady bought it illegally, and she looks real neat. You need to see you need to see a picture of her in ju- just before she took the medication. She's she obviously has some dysmorphia stuff going on, and took this and had a horrible like reaction to it swelling hospitalization so i i don't even think this is dysmorphia in this case i think a lot of people when they go on vacation want to be tan before they get to their vacation so she seemingly her stepdaughter suggested she take this drug and she bought it online there's no ingredients listed on the bottle the picture of the bottle literally looked like a lotion you would buy from, like, a mom at a farmer's market. <laughs> yeah, it did. So there's, like, no information about this at all. So I think it's actually really common that people get spray tans or go tanning before they go on vacation to get some sort of base or they just want to look, like, hot but I thought in the pictures. Point, I thought the point of the base was so when you went on the vacation, you didn't burn because it was your first exposure to sun. So if you had a tan that was caused by a drug that you were taking internally or that you sprayed on your skin that's not protecting you from future layers that you may acquire on vacation it can be but i also think it's an aesthetic thing like people just want to look tan on vacation but but she looks like she she dipped herself in like in ink that i i don't know there's a there's a glow and then there's like okay you've if you would talk about in in foundation terms, like she's she's five shades darker than she normally is. Like it's just, I don't know. Yeah. So I, I, I think that's kind of a dysmorphia thing, to be honest with you. Whatever. I mean, people like being tan. Like I I personally like I think I look nice when I'm tan, but I'm lazy and I'm never gonna get a spray tan. Like that's just what it is. Like I think I think when I've tan naturally, I've looked very nice and I like how it looks. But right now I'm white as a ghost. You could tell like every week we have an issue with the webcams because both of us totally white it out. And- I so this is actually funny because if you saw talk about seeing me in real life, right? If you saw me in real life right now, I look like. I, I look like an Oompa Loompa orange person, like the kids. And my husband's always like, you look, you remind me of my mom. You have this like orange line of foundation around your chin. And I'm like, yeah, when I wear my normal makeup color, the first time we tried to record, we went to Mac later that day and we're like, help us because I'm too white. Like I need to. And she told me what to get. No, so but, you um, have to wear a darker shade of foundation because literally if you don't, the camera does not pick up your face, which is so insane to me. It, it is. It's insane. Um, but like when I'm done re- recording and stuff, I always go and wash my face off because I can't really be seen in public with this color. Anyway, this lady took this nasal spray and was liking the results immediately. But then 24 hours later, she had a severe allergic reaction. She couldn't breathe. You know, the ingredients aren't on the bottle. She has no idea what she took. She had to go to the hospital. 
Um, they had to they had to give her steroids, you know. It and now she's warning others not to use it. Which like, I'm sorry, but if I heard like this nasal spray makes you tan, like I would think that was pretty suspicious. To and begin it's illegal. With. Yeah, it's illegal. <laughs> yeah. You know, you you just have to use your brains sometimes. So I don't know. I I could have told you this was going to happen without knowing it. <laughs> All right, next. Embryos created with genes of two men. So this new technology might soon allow men in same-sex relationships to have a child genetically. The technology uses skin cells from one person to alter genetics of a donated egg, and then that egg could be fertilized by a sperm cell to create viable embryo containing the combined genetics of the skin donor and sperm donor. So this could help a bunch of same-sex couples have, you know, their own child. It's also saying it could help, you know, people struggling with infertility. It's the same technology they used to clone that sheep in the 90s named Dolly. So I don't know. As far as I read, I think it's only for male same-sex. Yeah, for right now. For right now, because it looks like it's something that they're doing with the egg. So I don't know if they would be able to take skin cells from two females and put it on one egg. Well, and they, then... yeah, they're saying this technology could eventually go on to help women who can't produce viable eggs or they're, they don't have good eggs due to advanced age or cancer treatment or other causes. So eventually I think that's where they're hoping it will go. This certainly isn't going to be available for humans for a while, but they're really liking the improvement so far in the new technology. Yeah, I, I'm not a huge fan of, of messing with genetics like that and, like, being able to pick the sex of your child and all that and the eye color and this and that. So, I don't know. Like, I just – I think that screwing with nature a little bit like this is – I don't I don't know how I feel about it. I don't want to say I'm 100% against it. They're, when they take the skin cells from from one male and put it on a donated egg, then the child still isn't – just their child that still has a part of the other you know what I mean like you're not making this egg be a hundred percent from the man who's donating DNA to it it's just a portion of it so yeah yes the child would have both of their genetics but it also still has to have the other genetics yeah, like they from the essentially donation. would have three parents yeah exactly and I don't know how that turns out like that, you know what? I just thought of of um something that we should interview about. We should find someone to interview about the twenty three and Me and the D. We really need to talk to someone about the DNA and how this works in situations like that. Because, like, let's say, for example, a child's born like this, and then they have a DNA testing. They're going to come up with three different parents, and then how how do you even work with family trees and and everything? Like that. I'm just not, I, I'm interested in it. I want to talk about it. I don't want to say I'm 100% against it, but I think that, you know, it's like I always refer back to the Jurassic Park movie and them saying, you know, just because you can doesn't mean that you should. And there's a lot of things, and especially that could be said about AI, right? Like, yes, you can do this, and it's, it, it's probably great in some circumstances, but the horrible shit that could come from that might not be worth trying to figure out if you can actually do that technology that's all i'm saying all right next there's a horrible weed smell in new york so since cannabis was legalized in the city in 2021 the pungent odor has become increasingly common on the streets and people now want to move out of their houses because it's so bad all right now so you know what i put this story in here specifically because we were at elvis duran show last week and maria and i were walking around the city and we're like jesus it smells like well, you were like everywhere jesus, the smell does not bother me nearly as much as it's, you i prefer it to smelling cigarettes everywhere all the time i don't it doesn't bother me i just i yeah I, it does bother me like i just it i don't want to smell bothers it. You. it bothers me that every person is high all the time that's what bothers me like it's in the middle of the day there's no reason every single person needs to be high all around just to function every day it's weird to me like people have been high every day in your presence <laughs> it's just more obvious because now they could smoke more like publicly than smoking behind a closed door and walking outside it's just well well this is something that i didn't consider actually if you live in an apartment building a small building and it could go through the wall so easily and people are complaining about like the secondhand smoke from from marijuana smoke and it's it's a concern like according to lung.org 
they say that marijuana smoke secondhand is actually worse than tobacco smoke because just because something's natural and you're burning it, like when you burn anything, it changes the chemical composition of that. And inhaling that could cause changes to the DNA. It could cause problems to the cardiovascular system, which is is like a, a concern. And then if you have, like if they're smelling it that strong in their apartment, they could actually test positive for THC, which could be a problem if they're like, if that happened to Gabe at work, he would he could lose his job over that. Like that's a concern for some people. Everyone in the world can't can't be high. You know, there are some jobs still where you're not allowed. Like you can't at this job. Yeah, right. You wouldn't even know. <laughs> try try it, it might make it it might make it more interesting. Try to drug test me. Um yes. <laughs> I, Yeah, I mean, I understand the frustration, but it's like this is part of like so this this story follows a woman that owns an apartment in New York and she's saying that it's coming in her house all the time and she's smelling it and it's making her sick and she's complaining to the landlord all the time, but they can't really do anything about it because everybody owns these apartments. And I think that's just part of, you know, owning an apartment or a unit in a building with other people. You know, it's there's stories of people living next door to people that cook food that smells absolutely disgusting. Or think of Jeffrey Dahmer's neighbors like they weren't really having a good time. So it it doesn't really have in my mind, it really doesn't have to do with anything being legal or not. It just you have shitty neighbors. Yeah, but once you say it's legal, then more people are inclined to just do it in the open and not. I mean, honestly, why why wouldn't you even use a a a pen or something at that point? Like, it's just it's safer probably to do a pen than to actually burn it, and it doesn't smell, and it's just kind of like it's rude. I think I think cigarettes. Some cigarette smokers are the, kind of the wor- rudest people in the world, especially when you're in line at a Dunkin' Donuts or something and someone's smoking in the drive through when you're trapped there. It's it's rude. It's just it's it's rude. I, and you could do whatever you want, but like you shouldn't have other people have to smell it and inhale it. It's not it's really not fair. I really think people don't think about it because this, they're selfish. No, because the smell like is you know how cigarette you know if like if you smoked a cigarette in my living room right now, that smell would be in my house for a week. If I smoked a joint in my living room, that smell would go away quicker. So I don't think people are thinking of it because it's not as potent as cigarette smoke. So they're probably just like, oh, I just got home from work. I'm going to smoke a joint. And they don't really realize because the smell might fizzle out of their place by the next morning. Why? Because it's being sucked up out of the ventilation system into someone else's apartment? I don't know. It's just like, like, I understand this lady's complaint, but, like, you have to move. And yeah, everywhere you move in a building, there's going to be somebody that smells in some way or another. So it's kind of like, I, I don't think weed smoke's the biggest deal. I understand it's annoying, but I don't think it's, there's other smells that are way, way worse. No, I mean, I feel that way about, like, cigarettes. If I had to smell that next to my house, I, I just, I couldn't even deal with it. But I, I don't want to smell anything like that. Like, I, I see what you're saying, though, with food and everything, like microwaved fish. You just, you <laughs> that just That was a big control. one at the, at the, um, in the hospital at the, in the lunchroom, you know, we, we shared the lunchroom with the entire lab and it was just like, there's a lot of people working there and people would come and they would microwave fish. That was that was always excellent. The bottom line is you can't control what your neighbors are doing if you're sharing a wall. So it just it it's just the shitty part of, you know, living in a twin or in a unit or in a row home. You just unfortunately have neighbors that and they could do whatever they want because they own that place too. So like Yeah. You just gotta yeah. you gotta move if you really don't want to deal with it, but you probably will have to deal with it somewhere else too. Okay, this next one. On April 8th, the moon will pass between the sun and the earth, which will briefly block out some or all of its light, one of the most stunning celestial events known to mankind. So I can't wait. No, I'm excited. I'm like a kind of a huge space nerd, you know, and um it it's it's really exciting and it's going to be semi close to Philadelphia, so I think that we're gonna be able to see it ninety one percent or ninety point one percent of the eclipse, which is pretty cool without having to travel, except I heard that it might be cloudy that day, which is gonna suck. I don't know how they would really know that this far in advance. Um, but I'll definitely be outside trying to see it. And one of the concerns obviously is that you can burn your retina from looking at the sun. So it's called solar retinopathy, and 
it's really it's really not good to look at the sun because your your retina doesn't really have nerve damage. So if you're looking at the sun and it's completely damaging your retina, you wouldn't even realize it maybe until hours later. You can start having issues with blindness and just seeing spots and just really horrible things that come later and you wouldn't know it at the time. So you you could permanently damage your retina and and even go blind. Honestly, it's just it's so dangerous. So they're letting kids out of school because, again, you can't possibly have control over all these children that want to look up in the sky and see this thing unless you just make them stay. Well, the main concern in the house. is that it's going to happen right around the time schools get out. So yeah, they don't want them to be stuck in a situation where they're traveling home from school and they have no other choice but to look outside. So, yeah. And they're going to want to because they're kids and they just don't realize it. Like, I guess... I guess in there, like if you have a bright light in your house, let's say, and you look at it and it's so bright, like you turn your eyes away, you would, it, there's nothing physiologically that's telling your body, like, let's say for instance, when you open the stove and you touch something hot, you, you feel it and you pull your hand away so you don't get injured, right? You're not having that same response physiologically, like your eye isn't telling you, like, stop doing this, something's wrong. And once you damage your eyes, that's it. You can't, sometimes they cannot fix that and it could be permanent damage. So um, in, I have a favorite things on my Amazon, like an Amazon list on the favorite things on the website. What's the, what is the, um, the, you, is it? It's the doramater.com slash favorite dash things, but you can also find it in the description of every episode. Yeah. So I went on space.com and I found these like NASA approved solar eclipse sunglasses that they sell on Amazon and they're they're really cheap. They're like $15 and you get um I don't even think they're they might not even be $15, but they're around that and you get a couple pairs and then you get a book about how to safely view the eclipse. So I put that link on there so you guys can check it out and I ordered I actually ordered two for my family because I was hoping Maria would want to go see it too. Um it's it's cool. It's like it's not happening again for a really long time. It, you might not ever get to see it. It's very cool. I had a question about that cuz we had one in 2017. So why are th these two so We went we went to that, remember? Well, I was remember? at work when it happened, so you guys went somewhere. Yeah, we went to and it wasn't great cuz the we the weather wasn't cooperating. I remember we went to the to the firehouse and we went in the Camden waterfront and we were looking at it. I um, just when the kids were really little. I just texted my friend about this when I was writing my notes for this earlier because I vividly remember that day because we had just banned this woman from the bar and she came in and kept using the eclipse as a reason why she couldn't leave cuz she was oh, scared Jesus. to go blind and I'm like I can't believe this is happening right now. Just please get out of here. Yeah. And like being outside isn't going to do anything. It's just like looking at that little thin rim that's around the sun can burn your eye. That's she all. She was problematic on many levels, but that day is forever in my brain because I'm like literally battling this woman to leave. And then she kept being like, well, the eclipse is happening, so I can't go anywhere. <laughs> it's a valid excuse. Valid. Um, okay. On to other death news. So pathogens were found in cadavers at duke university school of medicine so for us everyday people can you explain what this means and why it's a problem so cadavers are bodies that are donated to the medical school so people like me and uh, medical students and anything anatomy physiology any kind of majors like that physicians assistants we all have to have a body that we dissect so we could learn anatomy it's the only way in my opinion to learn anatomy is from a real body and before we get these bodies, they have to be tested so they're semi-safe in case a student gets injured on one of them. So you can't obviously test for everything, but they test for major things like HIV, hepatitis B, hepatitis C. And they want to make sure that if, you know, we're doing the dissection and we get cut because you more than likely will, I've been cut several times throughout my career, that you're not increasing the risk that one of the students is going to get one of these pathogens, right? Um, so I guess they did studies. They they fi they figured out that they did testing on these and they some of them were testing positive for more of the dangerous like HIV, Hep C, and they were still letting the people dissect these cadavers for I don't know why. They don't really mention that in the article, but it, it is concerning because, like, they say, oh, it's probably not bad because all the students are wearing PPE, right, which is, like, personal protective equipment, so gloves and aprons and, and face shields and things like that. But 
that that doesn't mean anything because you can cut right through a glove like very easily with a scalpel blade and then get that infection or virus or bacteria. They were even they mentioned syphilis there, which I was like, did one of them positive for syphilis? I don't know. But um, certain ones like we before you would work on a body like this, you would be vaccinated for a hepatitis B. That's like a standard one that you get working in a hospital. Um, but hepatitis C, no, like you, you just have to like you get it and then you have to basically like wait and see if it makes you sick kind of thing. Um, so I, I think it is a concern. I think there's definitely exposures and I don't know like why they allowed these students to dissect these bodies, but it it might have something to do with the fact that they're kind of difficult to get sometimes and maybe they had a class going on and they just said, hey, we're just going to risk this because they need to have a body to dissect. I don't know. Yeah, it's just it's, really interesting. Yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of not cool. And it was between 2019 and 2023. They said there was about 700 people that touched these bodies. Yeah, they had to I, send I, letters to all of them. To yeah, them and I know. guarantee that out of these 700 people, like, there was somebody that got cut and had an exposure. So it just would be nice to know, especially because you've been going on with your life. You, like, if, if I were to ever get cut at the hospital, I would go get document it right away and be able to monitor it right away just to not know for years is is kind of messed up yeah for sure and they'll do nothing except get a letter you know yeah exactly sorry (laughs) okay so our last story is about this scientist that manipulated dna data in hundreds of cases over the last three decades so the colorado bureau of investigation found that a former dna scientist manipulated the data in hundreds of cases and she worked there for 30 years So the internal investigation found that Yvonne Missy Woods' handling of DNA testing data affected 652 cases between 2008 and 2023, including posting incomplete results in some cases. So they're doing a review of her work from 1994 to 2008, and there's also a separate criminal investigation into this. Yeah, so I guess her lawyers are saying that she never intent. I, I, I'm not 100% sure what's going on here, but she didn't intentionally do anything with the DNA that falsely imprisoned people or did not put people in prison that should have been there or kept people out of prison that should have been. Did I just say the same thing twice? I don't know. But <laughs> regardless, she she didn't do anything like that. But as from a lawyer's perspective, now let's say you had one of these people that she did the DNA on and they're in jail and you don't, especially if you think they shouldn't have been in jail, right? I'm going to be like, I don't trust anything that that lady did. And we need to look at every single case she did. Well, somebody is coming forward that was just in prison under one of her tests because they're saying that she had tested this hair from the crime scene and it was it turned out to be the victim's hair, not this guy's hair. So then the grand jury didn't end up pressing charges. But then another hair suddenly showed up that was apparently his. And that's what his conviction was based on is this hair, right? So the lawyer is saying that there's no record of this hair being collected at the crime scene. And they're like, where did she get this? You know, this reminds me of this. I I wish I remember this when you were interviewing Antoinette. There was this documentary on Netflix about a drug testing lab where this woman was, well, the first, it was a two-parter. So the first part was about a woman who was testing drugs and then doing the drugs. And then the second was this woman was just marking them all positive. So they had to let every single person she tested their sample out of jail because they didn't, they couldn't go back and retest them. That That's, well, that's what's happening here. Like, it looks like they're requesting, the state's requesting $7.5 million to look at these 3,000 tests that she's done over this time. And think about it. They have to redo all the tests, and then they have to go through all of the cases. It's just, it's an incredible amount of money and 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 resources. And why was she doing this? Was she sloppy, or was she intentionally doing this? Like, they didn't really... You know, I think a lot of this is laziness, and they were saying with the woman in the drug testing lab, she just had this, like, urge to be the top performer at work. So, you know, what was really the red flag in her case was she, I'm just, I'm just making this number up because I don't remember the specifics, but let's say on average a day, somebody could get five drug tests done in a day. She was getting done, like, 20. Yeah, which should have been an alarm because that, that was actually a thing 
dealing with my old career in the cytology world that people were trying to read so many pap smears that they would be taking them home and trying to read them so they could they would get paid per slide and stuff like that. So people were reading hundreds of pap smears a day just so they could make more money. And then finally, they put a limit and said, okay, a cytotech is only allowed to look at 100 a day because of that. Because yeah. if they don't, because they have to put limitations on that. And the, the only reason that that happened was because in that case, it was like some congressperson or some higher up in the legislative system's wife got affected by that pap smear not getting looked at. And that's why they, they put a squash on that. But they, they should have put a squash on that immediately. When you see that there's an average, like every employee could do this and then this other one does that, you have to be like, okay, so she's cutting corner somewhere. Well, yeah. And the best part is like, they were like, you should work more like so-and-so acting like every other employee at the agency is lazy and this lady's going above and beyond. And it's not like, okay, but you want to, you don't want to even like kind of look into why, like you don't even want to see what she's doing different to yeah. help the other employees out. You just want to assume she's doing better. So I, you know, this could be, this definitely could be laziness. I, or people get some sick satisfaction out of, you know, somebody's arrested and they're just like, well, you're arrested, so you must be guilty. So I'm going to make sure you're guilty. I mean, they said, they said that it said, quote, she has never created or repo reported any false inculpatory culpatory DNA matches or exclusions, nor has she testified falsely in any hearings or trial results. Well, that's what they, False that's what her lawyer's saying, though. Yeah, no, I know. But I mean, that so it either has to be that that she was being that she was doing it intentionally or that it was it was just sloppy accidental. But regardless, like think about the state, all the resources on top of all this money that the state has to put out now to just clear these cases. And if you're in prison right now and you really didn't do anything, this is what makes people like not trust the system, you know, and if. If they can't, the most important thing is if they can't backtrack and double check her work and prove that her results were correct, if they have no evidence or if they have evidence that she did something incorrectly, they have to let that person out no matter if they actually did it or not. So that's what happened in the drug case. They couldn't go back and test the drug. So let's say she got 50 samples of what they thought was cocaine, but she marked all of them positive, but five of them might have been like baby laxatives or powdered sugar, right? They don't know, and they don't have the samples anymore, so therefore they had to let the, all of the people out of jail. I don't know if that would happen in this case, because if they're able to... I think that's why they're doing the DNA test again, because if they come out the same yeah, if with her the same evidence, then... They're not going to let like 3,000 people that murder people No, that's people what I'm out. saying. Like for Kate, no, f they're going to double check all the cases, but for ones yeah. that they don't know for sure or ones yeah, that there's I mean, not enough evidence, they have to let them out because I don't know if that was the they, convicting quality. Yeah. I, I don't know if they would like let them out though or if they would like retry them maybe or something because they're, I, I'm not really sure what they would well, do. I don't in that think case, you but... could be tried twice for the oh, same yeah. crime in America. So. That's true. I don't know. So like, what out of my out of my pay range. Yeah. So I don't know. This this is an absolute this is an absolute mess. So I, I will be I'm very interested in this story, though. I'm going to be following this. Obviously, it's going to take a couple of years for them to go through all of these cases. We'll update you in 2026. No, seriously. OK, on to question of the day. Every Friday on the at Mother Knows Death Instagram, we put a little question box up in the story. So you could got you guys could ask whatever you want. So number one. What is your favorite kind of autopsy to perform? Oh, that's interesting. Um, I love I love to do ones where a person was seemingly healthy and then they just died and they don't know why. Because I want to find out why. That's pro I would have, say that. You have an ex well, I guess you. Do, can't I mean, give do you specifics. mean that or like body? Like I'd rather do like physically body, like like sk skinny people are easier to do autopsies on, like little old ladies. Just anatomically, they're very small and they, they don't have a lot of body fat, so they're easy autopsies to do. But as far as like what I um what I enjoy, like what gives me satisfaction that I'm doing something good is is like trying to figure out what happened. Interesting. Have we ever thought about bringing our husbands on the podcast? Oh God. So no. <laughs> no. 
I I think everybody would love Ricky's voice. He has a very deep, raspy voice. Everybody says he has a good voice for radio, but then he thinks they're making the joke that he has a good face for radio, which means you're ugly. <laughs> He has a good he has a good voice for certain radio. Like he would be good in the um as a horror movie trailer the, reader. A horror movie tra- yeah, like he would be good for there's the guy that does um for YSP for the Phillies and stuff. Like he has that kind of a good voice. Yeah. Definitely for, he definitely does. He has a very unique voice. But no, like I don't know. What do you think? I we, feel like he'd make fun of me the whole time with you, so I'm going to say that's a no for bringing yeah, him we on. Yeah, usually, we usually do gang up on Maria. And Gabe, um, we didn't, in the gross room, didn't we interview Gabe one time about some fire or something? And he was very serious. And we're like, can you act like you normally <laughs> Oh, my God. He was, like, talking at the lowest possible volume ever and he was he was like he, he was, was like, answering like <laughs> like he was on an interview f- for like killing someone or something he was like very matter of fact like he was reading text yeah it was like, like a police a interrogation little... yes, getting answers out of him and then you know th- we make fun of him the most because you'll just be like would you have for lunch today and then it's like the spongebob graphic four hours later <laughs> You're like I just it, asked you. It, it. It's seriously, he's brutal. He's he's brutal, and we're just like okay. Like sometimes, if we have a question for him that we like think we can, especially when we have gun questions, we always will ask my brother over Gabe because, like, I want a yes or no answer in two minutes, and Gabe will talk to you for an hour, and then you're like, I still don't know what the answer. No, remember one of our first episodes on on as mother knows death we had a story about a bb gun or something and i called louie and it was like a very quick 30 second explanation which i then used in the episode but if i asked gabe it would have been seven hours later i would have still had no idea what the answer to my question was <laughs> just that leave it. him alone his brain works differently than ours does we'll probably have them them jump in here and there eventually but we gotta we gotta figure that out Okay, last. How long does it take from start of recording to final editing and uploading? Well, everybody, it takes quite a while. So, the recording well, we start. We start in the mo- well. We collect the stories all week, so that's that's like an every day, all day thing. And then we we do the uh, we look up the stories a couple hours before we start. Yeah, for me, I'd say for me because I do the notes. The recording, the editing, and everything. that This is a 12-hour day for me. I'm done soon after this. I'm just... <laughs> You're done as soon as I we actually, get staff on this. I actually, it's it, it's it's around 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and I'm going to go pick my kids up from school and probably go to the boardwalk. Oh, you're it's going nice down day. the shore today? Real nice. I, well, what, I, it, what am I supposed to do? It's, like, beautiful out today. It's actually, like, a good day around here. It's oh. 75, and, and I'm, like, looking at the sun outside. and So you just get to go eat a nice ice cream cone on the boardwalk while I'm going to sit in my lair in it. <laughs> it's, like, five hours. Yeah, I'll, say, I'll send you a picture. Thanks. Um, oh, can you? I, I can bring you home. <laughs> I know. I was going to get me Irish potatoes. No, I don't want something. Irish potatoes. I want fudge. All right. I'll okay, I want chocolate fudge with walnuts in it. Um. Anyway, so it's about two o'clock right now. This the audio for this episode will probably go up around five, and then the YouTube. Be- well, the main problem with YouTube is that it takes forever when you upload it to like upload and render on there. So it'll probably be up by like six or seven, and then yeah. But I, I mean, we're I feel like we're getting better every week that we do this because in the beginning it was. Oh my god. It's brutal. In the yeah. beginning we'd record around like eleven thirty, twelve, and I wouldn't have the episode up till nine o'clock at night and then the YouTube wouldn't be up till around midnight. But it's it's definitely going faster. I mean, last week was really fast. I was done work by five thirty, which was totally unheard of for this. That was the fastest I've done it. This episode's n- nearly two hours. You know, right now we're at the one hour fifty seven minute mark. When I edit this and put the song in and everything, it'll probably be more like an hour and forty five. But and then you cut out all all the things that we screwed up or something. Yeah, I cut out one. We need to have like a like a at least like a YouTube episode of like all of our bloopers and stuff. Like, <laughs> yeah, because so funny. I'm sure you hear us say things that incorrectly sometimes, but there is just a point where you're like, I just have to keep going forward, or this is never going to yeah. end. But so. yeah, but sometimes it's just so bad. You're you're just like, okay, we can't put that on there, right? Yeah, absolutely. Well. 
Now that we're 10 hours into this episode, <laughs> thank you guys so much. We'll see you next week. Don't forget to visit DoraModder.shop to check out the count. I mean, it's only a countdown right now, but you could add it to your calendar and, you know, you get a little preview hint of this sick merch. They're very cozy yeah, sweatshirts I'm gonna, and t-shirts. I'm going to sport this on the boardwalk tonight and see what people think. Exactly. And we're so, so, so excited to go to CrimeCon and we can't meet, wait to meet you guys. So. We'll have more information coming out about that over the next couple weeks, and we hope you guys have a good weekend. See ya!